Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, whatever time you are tuning in. Welcome to Homesteading and Gardening in the Suburbs. I'm Emma from Misfit Gardening and today we're going to talk about improving soil over winter because winter's well on the way and there's lots of things that we can be doing to help our gardens grow without a lot of input from us as the snow is arriving. So, Let's dig in and learn a bit more. And first of all, we're going to talk about cover crops or green manures. Because if you've got a long growing season, then you might be able to squeeze in some cover crops and you grow those to really hold in the nutrients and stop them from washing away with the rain over fall and winter and early spring. And there's lots and lots of different cover crops that you can use. And I like to use a cover crop mix. You can get ones that are for winter and for fall. And they really help to build soil fertility over time, as well as, you know, other benefits like improving biodiversity. They provide habitat for lots and lots of beneficial insects insects. So there's a really good reason to start thinking about having cover crops and green manures in your garden. Yes, it can take up space, but there's a lot of benefits in giving them a little room to work into your crop rotation. Now, some cover crops are killed by hard frosts and those, you know, as they're decomposing, those nutrients that they've pulled out of the soil then return back to the soil for planting. So you kind of want to be careful about the type of cover crop that you're going to use. And you want to make sure that it it is something that is going to work for your area. There's cover crops that need to be cut back or they are turned in or dug in. Some you trample and you put black plastic over them um, to block out the light or you can put anything that's going to block out the light and it'll kill them off that way and what happens is after a few weeks those cover crops they're decomposing they're releasing the nutrients in and your plants that you're planting in there or your seeds that have been sown they'll then be able to have this flush of nutrients to get established. Now, I know it sounds kind of complicated for people and there's lots of videos and articles out on the interwebs and you can definitely check out to see how cover crops can be used in your garden. And of course, you're not limited to using them in a garden bed that's growing in the ground. You could use cover crops in a raised bed, in a garden box, a planter or even a container. There's lots and lots of of ways that you can use them. So definitely have a think about cover crops and green manures. I love the versatility that is out there. Now I'm not using cover crops at the moment other than buckwheat, which I I have a lot of the seeds still. Um, so I kind of add buckwheat here and there. I love it because it provides you know food for the bees and other beneficial insects. Um, I'm actually working on creating hugel culture beds and sheet mulching to build fertility into my garden. Now hugel culture beds they involve um, a lot of digging so you're going to be digging a trench and then you start filling that trench with partially rotting wood logs. Um, it doesn't necessarily need to be partially rotting. You can put in just sawn logs. Um, so if you've had a lot of brush cleared or trees that have come down in the wind, then you know you can put that wood to use in your garden. So you put these logs and stuff in the trench, branches, wood chips, all that good stuff. Then you would add the sod or the turf that you pulled up off the garden or off the ground and you put that so it's the grassy side face down on the logs and the branches then next you might add some spoiled straw or maybe you have cleaned out your coop ready for winter like put that on you can then add on some compost biochar topsoil and then finally you can mulch with fall leaves or straw now hugel book culture beds if I can say it right hugel culture beds they're tall or they can be tall they're often mounded and they shrink down over time it basically means hill culture and um, because they look like little hills that you're creating I've seen hugel culture beds that are over six foot tall I've seen ones that are maybe 
you know, a foot at, at the very most. Um, so it really depends on what you are wanting to create. Some people like the idea of creating them with a little bit of digging. Others like to just put them on top of the ground. Um, do whatever works for you. I find that partially dug a trench, um, you know, at least two speed widths down is what works for us. And that's what we're going to be doing for a lot of the garden beds. So we're going to be adding those logs in at least two shovel depths down. Um, you can make the beds as wide as you want. Um, I like to have garden beds that I can like reach over both sides or I with my legs, you know, so I can like plant things as I'm going. That is easier for me rather than planting one side, walking down and planting the other. But you could absolutely do these beds as wide or as short as you want. And you don't need to do them in an in-ground bed. And I'll talk about that in a minute. So the logs that you put inside of this trench, they kind of act like a sponge. So they start holding water. So over time, your plants are going to need less watering once those hugel culture beds are established. And it can take at least a year for those beds to establish. And making these types of garden beds in the fall means that, number one, materials are a lot easier to get hold of. Um, they're in, you know, way easier supply. Like if you're wanting fall leaves, maybe you've had a very blustery day and there's branches and logs that are needed. Maybe you're clear, clearing up the garden for winter and you need a place to put it all. Hello, hugel culture bed. Hugel culture is a great way to really use all the trashy stuff in the garden um, that needs to be taken care of and it's an easier way to deal with it because you're not necessarily having to shred and chip everything that needs to go into um, like a standard um, composter for example so it's a great way to put things in now over winter these beds are, are going to settle a bit and they're going to start breaking down and if you dig a really deep trench that's below the frost line you know things are obviously going to start keep moving because they're not going to be frozen solid but granted not everybody is going to be wanting to dig that deep and depending on where you are that could be really really deep so dig as deep as you want fill with logs and then just layer in other materials that are going to break down and finish with a good deep layer of compost and topsoil and you should be good now if you are wanting to build your bed earlier let's say you're going to build your bed in the spring then you're going to have to have a much, much deeper layer of compost and topsoil so that your plants have got plenty of room to grow whilst that hugel bed is starting to break down and release the nutrients. You don't want your plants to hit those nutrients when they're super high, particularly nitrogen, because you'll end up what's known as burning your plants and your plants will die off because the soil's too rich for them so giving them plenty of space to to grow whilst your bed is getting established is the better option um, but like I said I like to do this in fall because then I have all that time over winter for things to settle down and then in spring as the earth is waking up again I'm able to add my plants and get started planting without worrying too much about is there going to be too much nitrogen or too many nutrients available and my plants aren't going to be happy because of that. Now let's say you have a raised bed in a planter box or your um, gardening in containers. You can make these kind of hugel culture type of garden beds in those containers as well and certainly when I lived in the suburbs I had tall garden boxes that were made from was it three or four two by sixes that were on the the short end um layered up and then all of that was full of material and what we did was as we built the garden boxes we dug a little bit of a hole and we would layer in things like branches bits of you know, wood, like untreated wood from my husband's 
you know, woodworking projects and stuff. Again, it was really important that we used untreated because we didn't want those materials that were being treated anywhere near our garden. But we had um, all of this like brush that we had pulled up from other areas of the garden, any um, twigs and stuff from trimming up shrubs and things, all of that stuff. We basically buried it all at the bottom of these planter boxes. And if we had little logs and stuff that we came into, then yep, those all went in as well. And what we did was we buried all of that. Then we would add material from the chicken coop or fall leaves and we would pile those in, you know, good five or six inches. There was a lot of stuff in there. And then we would start adding on compost and topsoil that were mixed together. Maybe I would throw in some mushroom compost and stuff. Maybe I had regular compost out of our compost bin like all of that got put in there and even when I had compost that wasn't all the way rotted down out of the composter I added that to the garden beds as well because I knew that they weren't going to be used for a little bit now granted where I used to live I had a much longer growing season I was in zone seven so a lot (laughs) I was able to grow a lot more and a lot longer I mean I still remember harvesting tomatoes on Thanksgiving it was fine Um, and here like in Maine I definitely can't do that I have a much much shorter growing season now and one of the great things about having these hugel type of um, planter boxes was the first year they took a lot more water because there wasn't as much material like decomposed material that would retain the moisture and over time like over a, a year um all of that material like the leaves and stuff at the bottom of the box and those like shrub trimmings and stuff they all started to break down and it was actually as we were moving was really when those garden beds came into their own and they were incredibly productive we were adding you know little bits of compost here and there but actually they didn't need anywhere near the amount of water that we had been giving everything because there was such a lot of organic matter that was in there it just held the water held the nutrients and fed the garden so it's a really really great way to number one reduce the cost if you are having to buy in compost and topsoil um, it's a great way to reduce the cost because you're using these other materials and the other great thing is you can often find on classifieds and stuff where people are giving away logs and things like oh I've got bags of leaves if anybody wants them or I've got logs you know green logs that are for firewood or stuff Um, and sometimes these things are being given away for free and if you can you know talk to people and find out like hey did you spray these things you know have you used any pesticides you know if you have somebody that you could talk to and they haven't used them then that might be a really good option for you to use in the garden so there's some options there now in a container you can also do the same thing obviously it's not going to take as much material because you're in a container and one of the things that we did on our garden um well outside the chicken coop garden so we have like little planters and stuff so in the old barn that had to get pulled down we found some old metal feeders now these were kind of rusty and they weren't going to be good for the chickens to use but we thought they would make kind of cute planters to have you know little annual plants growing you know maybe some marigolds or some herbs and stuff that we can put into the chicken coop you know give them something to do something to pack and eat and stuff and because they were really tall I mean these held a lot of chicken feed um we actually filled up the the center feeder with you know bits of wood logs twigs leaves all of this stuff and then we put on our mix of and we actually had composted manure that we put on um and I mixed in some soil from 
from the yard in there um and they've been growing really great actually my my herbs like rosemary have done incredibly well in that um the first year i mean granted this year we have had a lot of water so there's been a lot of rain that's on those um but over time the materials in that container are going to shrink down and i'm going to be able to add more compost a little more topsoil maybe and um, help keep that fertility in those containers without having too much work to do um, so that's a good option as well for people to think about like get creative in the garden and feel free to experiment um, and that's that's really like one of the best pieces of advice I can give to people is just kind of experiment and see you know hey I wonder what happens if I if I do this because you might discover something awesome now let's talk about sheet mulching because that's the majority of what I have been doing um, on my garden is sheet mulching. And sheet mulching is a little bit like hugel culture, but without the need to bury anything. So what you do is you smother grass and weeds with thick layers of cardboard and then anything that you happen to have handy that's going to break down, you throw that on top. So we're talking things like grass clippings, fall leaves, stuff from cleaning out the chicken coop you know if you're a chicken owner and it's fall now you are probably thinking of clearing out the coop if you have birds that are in a stationary coop and getting everything ready for winter because a lot of us use the deep litter method you know we're not going in and cleaning out the coop all day every day during winter and in some areas that's kind of impossible to do because of the snow so you know if you are planning on clearing out giving your coop the last clean out before winter then you know this is a great way to use up that material so you layer on all of this stuff and then you layer on compost and topsoil and you want that to be at least six inches deep and then you can put a mulch on top so maybe that's shredded fall leaves or maybe it is straw or whatever you happen to like for using mulch and you know this is exactly how a lot of my garden beds in ground have been built in the garden and this is how I built my orchard back in Utah was by having this setup where I sm smothered the grass clippings I then layered on some other materials that were going to break down and then we added some compost and stuff we added on some you know, well rotted manure that we had gotten from a horse farm and then we covered everything um, with a good six inches seven inches maybe eight inches deep of wood chips and that was all that I did for my orchard and it was amazing the difference that it made it turned this little like sketchy really sandy difficult to grow anything area in my garden or in, in the yard to this incredibly productive like there was, I don't know, seven, eight trees in that area. There was a central um, maple tree, which was very pretty. And we didn't necessarily want to cut it down because it was helping to stabilize the temperature and things there whilst those trees were getting established. And year after year after year, it was getting better and better and better and more and more harvests. And I really miss that orchard because I had all of these wonderful herbs and stuff that was growing there. It was just, it was a beautiful place to spend the time. And all of it was done by sheet mulching and covering with wood chips. So we just really used what we had available there and again doing the same thing here so we're putting these beds together and the the older beds are the most productive because those materials have broken down and are releasing nutrients for the plants and a lot of the beds that I've made in the garden here in in Maine have been just cardboard and wood chips because that is all that I had available I had a lot of cardboard coming through my neighbors have given me cardboard um, we've had cardboard from you know deliveries of stuff you know we just saved all of that cardboard and put it all down and then 
we had some wood chips that were delivered luckily because as um there was some tree trimming that was going on to protect the power lines uh, was it last year and um i just happened to be home when they were going past and i asked them if they would drop off the wood chips when they were done down the street and they did which was great <laughs> um so now anytime i happen to see people having you know anything trimmed and stuff you know it's like hey are you needing the wood chips if you need a, a space to um drop your wood chips you know bring them bring them over here because it's for me i really like to have a lot of wood chips like they're great to go in the chicken run because the chickens like to scratch through them and stuff and but really i love to use them in the garden and i like to use them on the garden beds rather than in the footpaths because even though i've had wood chip footpaths i always find that things seem to grow so much better in the footpath than in the garden bed so and uh, i don't mind mowing mowing's kind of fun sometimes so i like to provide some habitat where some good beneficial insects can hang out so that's why i don't use wood chips on the paths anymore but on the garden bed and you know these sheet mulch beds or wood chip beds that i've been building even the hugel culture beds they're all better in the second season and this is because a lot of the materials are breaking down slowly over time they have a lot of carbon in them like cardboard takes a while to break down wood chips a long time to break down if you were adding these materials to your compost bin you know that you would need to be adding a lot more like fresher materials containing a lot of nitrogen to offset this high carbon so they'll actually start breaking down so because many of these materials break down slowly they are, your beds are going to start to shrink and they're going to shrink over time and this is totally normal so for you know if you're new to building these types of garden beds like don't panic and don't panic if this is your first year growing in them and it is a rough harvest or no harvest at all like this is kind of part of the process um and you got to do what works best for you and for your garden now we've tried growing a green manure or a mixture of cover crops in in the beds the first year um we've tried planting veggies in our second year but now we just kind of try to grow things in them anyway and some garden beds depending on the mixture of what has been laid down in the sheet mulch some of them have gotten established much quicker than others and it's just down to the materials that i had available when i was building them now for example garlic was our first crop that i put in the first bed that we put together and it grew incredibly well um i only gave it a little compost tea or comfrey or nettle tea maybe a little bit of fish emulsion to counteract the nitrogen in the soil being tied up with those wood chips breaking down but i wasn't fertilizing them with these you know natural homemade type of um diy fertilizers like i i wasn't feeding them with this stuff every week it was i maybe fed them like twice three times at the most during the growing season when i remembered so i still had a really really great harvest of garlic with really big bulbs and um you know most of that just comes down to having that fertility in the soil anyway so again it's experimenting and seeing what works with you if you look if your plants look like they're struggling a little bit then maybe giving them a little feed with some you know higher nitrogen type of fertilizer that you've made naturally like fish emulsion that tends to be one of the higher ones um but if you're vegan and not wanting to introduce animal stuff into your garden then comfrey or nettle tea is another good option as well but those types of fertilizers are going to help provide the nitrogen that is then going to help give your plant a boost without having to kind of fight for some of the nutrients from things like wood chips breaking down so that's an option as well now this year we've been working on composting a lot more with our three pallet compost bins 
And unfortunately, or fortunately, these are now lush winter squash jungles and they've even got tomatoes growing in them. So I kind of left them alone when I saw that these plants had gotten established because some of the other plants in the garden were struggling with the the water and the weather. So I just kind of said, well, you know what, we're going to let these grow and see what happens. So I harvested a Delicata type squash um, from it the other day, but there's kind of acorn type of squashes in there. There's pumpkins, there's all sorts of stuff growing. I even saw some little butternuts. Um, so that'll be kind of interesting to harvest those and see how they taste. Um, but those were all volunteers that were growing. And I love saving seed and growing out volunteer plants because sometimes you kind of find something that's really, really awesome that has just been kind of hiding out in the seeds, just waiting for a chance to grow. But because my composters are no longer available to add the compost, what's a girl to do with things that are needing to go into the compost? Well, everything coming out of our kitchen either goes to the chickens, the wormery, or to the Bakashi composters. That's my composting stream. Now we're on a slightly bigger homestead. Obviously, the chickens take a lot of stuff, but there's things that they can't have. Um, the wormery will take a few things, and... Um, you know, the Bakashi composter will take the rest. So things that can't go to the worm rate. Now I need to give a big shout out to Heather if you're listening, because you definitely inspired me not to give up on worm composting. And you told me all about the method that you use with an old cooler for your worm farm. And I got to tell you, it is working incredibly well for us. So thank you so much for reaching out and telling me all about it. And if you have been failing at having a worm farm and it's just not working with like one of those purchased worm farm type of composters, um, you know, think about building one from a cooler uh, because it is working for me incredibly well. And I'm actually really excited about having to harvest that worm farm um, relatively soon, actually, because there's so many beautiful worm castings that are there that are just going to help my garden grow in the next next year. So I'm just thrilled, thrilled so much about this. So on one hand, I have things going to the chickens. So they're helping to feed the chickens and offset the amount of, you know, commercial chicken feed that they're using um, when they're not, you know, out on the ground scratching, you know, on the pasture. Um, The wormery is obviously producing worm castings, which is going to help condition the soil and provide some additional nutrients and microbes and stuff and then the bakashi composters a lot of our kitchen waste goes to the bakashi composting and the bakashi composter is a pre-composting treatment it uses microorganisms that thrive in a low oxygen environment that ferment and pickle the waste so bakashi composting means that things like meat fish and dairy that even some small bones So things that other family members are eating, not necessarily me, those can all be composted and we can put even more nutrients back into the soil. We also add things like onions or citrus scraps that the chickens and the worms can't have. So those Bakashi buckets get filled and I collect this, you know, materials in a little compost collector container thing on the counter and then I pour it into a Bakashi bucket and what I do there is I sprinkle Bakashi bran that is filled with all of these effective microbes I sprinkle that all over the um, materials that are being added to that compost bin and then I push the air out of it and then I put the lid on that bucket. So you're creating this anaerobic or low oxygen environment and these microbes that are on this bran start to basically pickle the materials that are in there. Now, once that bucket is full, you need to leave it closed for four weeks before you can bury it in a trench. Normally, I put my bakashi in the middle of the compost pile. So as I'm turning the compost, I'll put, you know, the top half in the next pallet composter. Then I empty out my bakashi compost and then I take out any, you know, good material from the other half of the compost that I'm 
turning, you know, sift out all of that good stuff and then I'll finish burying the bakashi with other materials and that helps my compost to be very active and breaking down very quickly i'm able to get a lot more compost out of my compost piles because this bakashi compost is like a really really good way to accelerate a sluggish compost pile However, because of my um, squash and tomato growing escapades, uh, volunteers that are growing, um, in the normal compost pile, I'm having to bury my bakashi. It's actually the normal way to deal with your bakashi buckets. So digging a hole, digging a trench, emptying your bakashi into there and then burying it again. And it'll break down in about two weeks, four weeks, six weeks at the most. Um, so it's it's a very rapid way to generate a nutrient rich area in your garden. So this year I have been digging a trench, digging holes and adding it to my garden beds. And the great thing is if I dig a trench and I'm just adding this, you know, emptying a bakashi bucket and then covering it with soil and stuff and leaving it to break down next year this is going to be really lovely nutrient rich soil that is going to let my heavy feeding crops whether it is brassicas like cabbage or kale or whether it's things like squashes and pumpkins maybe even corn it's going to be a really really lovely you know rich soil for them to grow and grow well and I mean you don't necessarily need to be composting with bakashi to do trench composting either Um, you want a nice deep trench to put your food scraps in and then be sure to cover things well with soil to keep smells and flies out the way Um, like I said I like to cover with soil and then I cover with wood chips and I have been digging this really long trench and holes and stuff randomly all over in my garden basically if there is a space where plants are not growing right now and it's big enough for me to put in my bakashi bucket, I'm going to be digging a hole and then emptying my bakashi bucket because I want to get as many of these in the ground in my garden before the ground freezes for winter. So next season, my plants are going to have lots and lots of really rich soil to help them grow. And that can only be a good thing. But trench composting is a really good option for people um, to think about for your garden especially if your composters are full you're not able to get anything more in your space is limited and you want to be able to compost and use a lot of these nutrients that are coming out of the kitchen you don't want to just throw them in the trash so there's options and if you're growing in containers or in tall garden boxes you can even think about adding a wormery or a worm composter to the bed there's a ton of articles and videos of gardeners that basically take like a plastic tube like a downspout from a house drilling holes in it part of the way up the length of the pipe and then you bury it with that perforated end in the soil and part of the pipe sticking up out of the garden bed and so you know where it is um, and then you just fill that pipe with food scraps and composting worms there's even tall planter towers that are using worms to help your garden grow and you can buy those there's also DIY options for those and honestly since it's the end of the growing season you might be able to pick up garden planters really cheap at the store on clearance or check out your local classifieds and see if there's a great deal there so there's lots of options that are there for you you can incorporate a traditional composter into a taller growing bed you could have a compost bed that you move onto different sections of your garden beds so you could build like a pallet composter with four pallets and keep everything enclosed and you take it down at the end of the season and spread out all of that compost along one garden bed and then next season you add you know, you build your full pallet composter, you know, by basically creating a cube with 
four pallets creating each one of the sides and um, build that onto another garden bed and then that's where you add all of your materials to start build up throughout the season then at the end of the season you move everything down there's lots and lots of options and lots of ways that you can get creative with adding fertility into your garden so and you might be wondering can I combine some of these methods and try them out in your garden and yes you definitely can it's your garden so you if you want to experiment then give it a try right the the only thing that can really happen is you learn what works and what doesn't for your garden so I would love to know from you what method are you using to add fertility to your garden this fall let me know over on the Facebook group until next time I hope your garden grows beautifully And I'll see you next time.